Okay, got a couple of little sort of bugs um, about uh, a couple of things. I just wanted to kind of get out there. Uh, I have an idea, and once I finish a couple of the sort of fiction stuff I'm writing, maybe doing a non-fiction, um, which I always said, I just kind of felt like, eh, I don't know if I'm smart enough to write that, let alone having to do all like the research and everything. Um, but one of the things I wanted to do non-fictionally is the sort of history of Neijiaquan, so like the internal martial arts in China. Now, one of the biggest things with that, I mean, I'll, I'll get to it here in, in a second too, but uh, is that Sun Sen Feng, whether or not he existed, for one. For two, whether or not he is the creator of Taiji Chuan and, and did so on Wudong Mountain, so like the Wudong system is, is the progenitor of Taiji. Or Chen Wanting was the creator of Taiji, which the people who kind of follow Chen style will say is, is the creator of that. Um, I had a hypothesis many years ago, not a theory, because it's not tested and and proven or any of this other stuff so most of the time people say, i have a theory no the crap you don't you have a hypothesis at best so my hypothesis and it is one that i have since having formed the hypothesis uh have read a few places here or there a couple people not a lot uh most people kind of go as sansen feng and wudong created taiji or you know the chen family chen wanting created taiji um, but I have a hypothesis which I'll kind of get into as we sort of talk about this. So this isn't going to be, this this is not going to be the huge sort of, um, you know, many hours long comprehensive review of all of the entire history of of Chinese martial arts and then the internals and all this other stuff. It's, it's, it's going to be a little bit broader uh, than all that, but it's going to bring in some stuff that I don't think a lot of people think about or at least if they do I have not really been exposed to them thinking about it with that either from reading or videos or talking to people or anything like that um, but also part of my hypothesis with Sun Tzu Feng is um, I also don't hear a lot of either people kind of do the one or the other so um, a lot of people will start at Shaolin Temple. Now that is, as they say, a very good place to start. However, I think, for me at least, I want to know what created the conditions in Shaolin, that, that, that uh, the setting conditions, as it were, that would allow them to be able to set up, you know, um, martial arts from, from Asia as we think about it today because that was kind of where it, it kind of started so what we have if we take uh, you know, there's a couple of things that that really brought into the sort of DNA of Shaolin Temple and then therefore is f in further DNA of, of pretty much most of the sort of like Asian martial arts as they track through China and, and through Korea and Japan and maybe down into like Thailand and, and out to like Indonesia and things like that. There's a few things that kind of go in there. Uh, one is the, the sort of indigenous native Chinese influence, which has a couple aspects to it. And then other, other influences came in from India. Now Shaolin Temple uh, was a Buddhist temple so automatically right there, there is, uh, you know, Indian influence coming in from Buddhism as well. Uh, so that kind of started off uh, from that influence. Then later when Bodhidharma or Dhammo came in there and, and maybe some other people, you're bringing in now these other influences as well. You know, Bo Dhammo is credited with, with giving them things like the Yijin Jing, uh, exercises so you know everyone was was meditating and, and meditating so much their bodies were kind of left to not being amazing 
Uh, so some of these exercises like the Yi Jin Jin and things like that were, were designed to help make the bodies more fit and, and stronger and, and hale and hearty, etc. in order to be able to then meditate and do the spiritual practice more. But some of those things, there's a lot of animal mimicry going on in with that. And one of those ways that comes in is India has a martial art called Kalai Payat. And I'm probably slaughtering the pronunciation. And if so, I apologize. That's the best way I can, I can kind of say it, given from what I've heard and tried to, to see when I've read about it. So Kalai Payat... Uh, again, has a lot of animal mimicry to it. I think they even have stuff that uh, almost kind of mimics like elephant stuff. So you can even maybe see how that influence kind of went, you know, after maybe some Shaolin and then some of the Indian influence went back down. When you're talking about like maybe Moi Borat, Borat, not Borat, that's not right. I'm so, uh, the, the sort of predecessors to Muay Thai. Um, so we have Kalari Payat, uh, so we have Buddhism. Kalari Payat and probably yogic exercises. Now, not just the sort of, um, what is that, Hatha that we mostly have here, where it's, it's just the real sort of stretchy yoga. Uh, and I've seen a, a lot of it and talked to a lot of people, and a lot of the meditation, spiritual aspect, and sort of, you know, mythological symbolism seems to be pretty damn lost a lot. Uh, as it came over here, you know, Taiji's got the same thing to it, uh, you know, where it's a sort of like, you have, oh, just play and relax and all that, and there's no intent to it, no one knows, and you know, I've had people like, oh, I took Tai Chi for five or six years, oh, okay, so, you know, I don't have to teach you about, you know, the lower Dante, the, the postnatal lower Dantean breathing, or the eight energies and the stepping, they're looking at you as if you really are just the glossolalia, you're speaking in tongues, they have no idea what you're talking about. I'm like, you took Tai Chi for five, ten years, you don't know anything about the eight energies, the five steppings, uh, postnatal breathing, none of this? Because all that got lost, because it, uh, part of it is some people learned a little bit, and then went off to um, monetize it as quickly as possible, things like, you know, transcendental meditation, same kind of thing. Uh, and then some people just didn't get a transmission but thought they had it and some other people are like yeah 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 you're good okay whatever and then and a lot of people just don't want to put the the effort into learning it correctly you get people who are like oh i teach tai chi or i teach yoga oh how long have you been doing it i've been doing it a few years oh where did you learn like who's your teacher well i went through this course and not like a college course for 16 you know, weeks or anything which is where i started and then branched off from there you know, I think within the first week or two of my Tai Chi class with my teacher, I was like, I just wanted, I, I would like to be your student and learn, like, everything. So I was side training with my teacher while that course was going on and then, you know, have never stopped in coming up on 21 years. Uh, so, but, you know, so there are people who are, you know, they took a, they took a, um, you know, a workshop, and then they're, they got a little certificate from the workshop, and then they're going out there like they know yoga, or they know Tai Chi, or they know Qigong, or something like that. So a lot of that stuff gets lost. So now what I'm talking about is real, uh, honest-to-goodness yoga with all the other stuff in it. You know, not holding the posture just for 30 seconds or whatever, just holding it for however many minutes or breaths you're supposed to do it. You know, and understanding the mythology behind it of like Parvati, trying to bring Shiva in to try and help alleviate the suffering of the people in the world. You know, stuff like this, you know, the actual energy work to it. Being able to correctly root and then open up like the chakras and the kundalini and things as opposed to just, well, we put together these three things and here's your 90 minute video and open up your kundalini and open up your chakra. No, you're going to, you're going to F yourself up. You're doing, I have a whole other video about being careful about opening up all the energy stuff and because that that will mess you up if you don't do it right uh so like the genuine stuff with that so we have you know and then and then with uh, we have a i forget the the indian name of it but there's a a sort of a translation that became chan and then chan as it went to japan became zen so we have this through line from india going in through like shaolin for Chan Buddhism, which became Zen, which people are a little bit more familiar with. So the, those influences the Buddhism, a couple waves of Buddhism, 
probably genuine yoga, probably Kalari Payat, uh, you know, are in there and being kind of re-stirred up down in Shaolin. Now, what we have from indigenous roots of China are a couple of different things. One would be would be like the precursor to what we have now for Zhao. You know, the, the, the sort of Chinese wrestling it means with the locking horns, you got the jackets and the throws and the takedowns and stuff like that. So it's probably a little bit more like Japanese jujitsu, judo ish sort of thing, because that, that, that kind of has uh, those are kind of the offshoots of the, of the Swai Jiao as well, where, you know, the jujitsu and, and the judo. And, uh, but that was also what a lot was taught. You no, know, that was poor grammar so that was also taught a lot with some of the military stuff as well so we have you know and 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 there are there are histories of people who would go into Shaolin after having been through um, uh, military life so they you know they were burned out from from you know the the realities of military life 2020 between now and 2500 years ago and all the all the time in between and all that other sort of stuff so they were burned out from that and, and so they sought some sort of solace and retreat and and several people went into um to Shaolin temple i'm trying to remember i can't remember the the name but i believe that even the 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 reason why you have the one-handed sort of bow at Shaolin is when Damo was was in the cave meditating for nine years, he had someone who was um, uh, very much wanted to be a student, and he was an ex-military guy, according to some of the stuff I've read. I don't know how consistent it is across the board, people knowing he was military, but I've read I've read things and heard people talk about this guy was a military guy, and Damo was like, no, 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 I'm not going to teach you, I'm not going to teach you. Just look, I'm meditating, go away, and he kept was very persistent and the demos it, it was either if it snows red or if you cut off your arm uh it could have been depending upon who you ask could have been one could have been the other uh but either answer uh, the guy figured out what to do and drew his sword and cut off his arm so this is why in in shaolin stuff a lot of times you see like the the robe where like the one arm is bare and they do like the one arm thing is to honor that guy who cut off his own arm apparently I don't know how you did that with just a sword and one stroke not have like a lightsaber I don't know it's probably somewhat apocryphal but um, I personally would not have the willingness to do that or just the strength to do it but uh uh, but the, but that's just sort of illustrating how you know even now this military guy became that important where they're you know for two thousand years whatever or fifteen hundred years or however long it's been you know they altered their dress and 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 mannerisms to have that thing so these military guys were going to have importance to that so they brought in a lot of that military training and Swaijia would be included in that as well as you know literal martial arts. Uh, uh, of teaching people you know, how to defend things. So in the Shaolin, it's sometimes they get raided, so they had to have ways to be able to defend themselves as well because people would still go after them for whatever they thought they might have had. Now, also from China, we're talking Taoism. So the sort of indigenous, shaman, shamanistic energy practices um, life-sustaining, enhancing, uh, journeying uh, practices indigenous to China. So I think it was Bruce Kumar Francis said something, I'm going to paraphrase this, I can't remember the exact quote, but it was Taoists were, were basically, they were able to map basically like the internal structures and 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 things of the body. So everyone wants to be, you know, and, and nowadays we have our, our modern materialistic reductionist bull crap. But, ma but magically now we're starting to find, oh, well, we've got neurons in more than just the brain. We've got them by the heart and by the stomach. And this whole thing with the vagus nerve. And we're finding these, these points 
in the body, these areas in the body that that have neurons and nerve clusters and along the vagus nerve and very important, huh, they just so happen to coincide with chakras and dantians. Oh my goodness, maybe, maybe people who spent their entire lives all day, every day, meditating and mapping those internal parts of the body, maybe they understood something. And just because we couldn't have measured it in the last 20 years doesn't mean that it's not valid, reliable, or something we might not be able to measure later on. Uh, but then again, we do have scientists who take a very religious view of whatever paradigm they're sort of chalked into their brain when they're in college and then they resist any other sort of information that comes in despite what the religious party line of it is. Uh, so we have these people who, and I, again Bruce Kumar Francis was saying they originally had like 200 some odd standing postures and you know different breathing methods and like the qigong which is the energy work and then how some of like the the sort of shaman practices came in with that too and being able to map and, and move through the meridians and the acupuncture pressure points and all this other stuff as well. So like Tibetan Buddhism has a lot of like the Bon uh, shamanistic uh, traditions from Tibet in it. And that's one of, the, one of the reasons it's sort of been cracked down on a lot because it, it, it's carrying on this tradition uh, that's much older and indigenous to that area. But we have uh, from China this this huge, this this wonderful wonderful uh, practice out out out. Taoism and Buddhism have had religious layers layered onto them later on. They should not be really religions. Um, even I think the Dalai Lama or something was saying you can be a Catholic Buddhist or a Muslim Buddhist or anything because it's you know it's it's a certain philosophy. And a certain way of like kind of looking at things or, or and, and, and thinking and feeling but it doesn't necessarily negate or neglect any of the other stuff that's going on same thing with Taoism you know uh, I personally struggle with any organized religion because then you have someone else's paradigm you have someone else's focus and intent you have someone else's agenda overlaying what is essentially a very personal individual practice you know, if we talk about sort of indigenous American practices, we've got over 500 nations just in North America alone, or at the very least the continental United States. I, I can't remember if that number, the 500 plus, incorporates Canada as well. I can't remember exactly, but I mean, e either way. So there's not going to be one specific, this is Native American religion. No, 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 it doesn't work like that. There are certain underlying principles that that do uh, sort of permeate through the different cultures through the continent and one of the things with that is that even though you might have this sort of medicine people or shamans or or or, or people or even people who are just carrying the medicine bundle for the family or, or the village or anything like that the connection with the Great Spirit, the connection with nature, the connection with the ancestors, the connection with the animals, and all this other stuff is still essentially an individual thing. So if someone is trying to take away your individual sort of spiritual sovereignty and replace it with theirs, I have a problem with that personally because that is not the way it's supposed to be. That is not how one becomes a spiritual connected being at least from my practice uh, which is uh, uh, I don't know, comprehensive maybe that might, might be too big of a word either too but you know I've looked around and, and read and listened and talked to and, and tried out a lot of stuff uh, and it just really seems that it, it's got to be something that you do for you so, and this, this would still be a Taoist approach in with that as well, even Buddhist. So that, of course, being indigenous to the thing and people knowing this and practicing this on, on a variety of levels would have 
bled into Shaolin as well. So we have all these different things, and then Shaolin almost becomes like this this sort of uh, uh, pressure cooker or or you know pot where all this stuff kind of gets stewed in and stewed together. And through you know the the yoga and the qigong and the martial practices and the stuff and all that comes now this this ever growing and evolving now sort of systemized idea of martial arts that is is more what we think martial arts now you know the the traditional meaning of wushu we see wushu now and we think the sort of like you know wire foo big acrobatic flips and big things and and the people in the tournaments have to have half a football field to take you know um, a full-on 440 running start to be able to do a flip and they stop and pose and they get up and and their athleticism and their their agility and their flexibility is wonderful but some of the martial stuff doesn't is sort of like where is it uh, you know, and then you, you see a lot of stuff with, with movies and TV where it, some of it looks really fancy. And again, the, the athleticism, the discipline, the flexibility, even the intent behind a lot of that is, is insane. Like the people who are really good at that are wonderful athletes and have dedicated a lot and, and been very intent with that. But the, a lot of the martial stuff isn't there. But originally, wushu would mean almost like war art, so martial art. So we... we then and there was where that sort of started to evolve in what we think about it now. So now we have like routines, the Japanese would later call kata, uh, so we might be used to hearing words like that. We have forms or, or patterns or routines, uh, things like that. So that's kind of where that exploded and came from. So you have, you know, the sort of like basic fist forms and fist routines, and then you start having like the different animal mimicries, like the five main animals and some of the ancillary ones. You start getting like drunken boxing and all this other stuff. And they had internal, have, have present tense, including then and now um, internal systems too. A lot of the times, what you're going to see if you go to Shaolin or see the, the traveling things or anything, and I had the opportunity to see that many years ago, Wheel of Life tours, amazing. People with such amazing ath- athletic ability, they do like those sort of butterfly twisty kicks, and and you understand where the legends of of people being able to fly across rooftops or something like from Iron Monkey or Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon comes in, because there's a moment where you watch these people jump up, and there's a weightless moment. I mean, it, it looks like something should in space. It's just weightless, and then you know they come back down and, and do that, and they. You know the iron shirt training and and all that other stuff, but you'll have some of the more wushu ones. You might have some of the ones that are a little bit more into the sand show, so like the kickboxing with the throws and takedowns. But then there's other ones that you don't see what they're doing, and probably some of the routines that they're doing and playing m- might not be as pretty as we would think. But man, are they gonna put a hurting on you when they're practiced with it? You know what I mean? So they have. They have that practice, they have that training, and then it feeds back in to their meditation and to their qigong aspect of it and, and their interactions with, you know, trying to alleviate you know, their suffering and, and work through their shadow self and like the karma, which is like means the action that they built up, trying to work through all that. So it feeds back in with there. So out of that, now we're going to get back to Zan Sen Feng that we talked about 20 minutes ago. So legend would have it, if Zan Sen Feng was a real person, if, and I've seen two sort of wildly, two, or two main sort of wildly different dates when he was around. So if he was a real person, and, you know, allegedly, I think Chang Jun Bo or something like that was supposed to be his name, they, they actually call... Jet Li's character that in the Tai Chi Master movie that he's in where he plays Sun Sen Feng. Uh, and he starts off as a Shaolin guy with that too. Uh, it was the first Jet Li movie I saw. And then Kung Fu Call-Up Master, which is amazing and for different reasons. But So allegedly, if Sun Sen Feng was a real person, he started off learning stuff from Shaolin. Then he left Shaolin, went to Wudong Mountain, 
and the, there's the, again this this is where some of the stuff gets a little jumbled because he was probably learning a lot of Taoist stuff as well so it's almost like he had the Shaolin thing which had some Taoism in the DNA the Qigong and, and the energy work and oh that Qigong uh, and some of maybe some of those stance and some of those other practices and the different breathing and stuff like that and then he trained with some Taoists and that like brought back up and and reintegrated that stuff from Shaolin in with this more Taoist stuff uh, so if you if you watch they actually have a there's a lot of stuff you can watch from Wudong Mountain and everything like that and if you just watch the Wudong styles not when they're talking about Wudong Taiji, Wudong Xingyi, Wudong Bagua not talking about those I'm talking about if you start watching things like their dragon forms their tiger forms some of their other like Gong Fu that doesn't have Taiji, Xingyi or Bagua slapped on it it looks kind of Shaolin like you can see where yes this is this definitely has principles that you maybe you don't see a lot of in Shaolin so a lot of like the whole body the relaxation the breathing the coming from the Dantian a little bit more a little bit less of the actual gross muscle strength and then into internal and relaxed kind of starting there but it still looks pretty damn Shaolin it looks pretty damn hard too Hard isn't difficult as, as opposed to hard isn't strength but some of that a little bit as well so he probably you know was learning it and reintegrated that in now allegedly he either saw or had a dream of a snake fighting a crane you know a snakes trying to get the cranes you know nest and the cranes you know fighting the snake off so between the sort of undulating relaxed circular motions and you know the relax and then fudging sort of strike of the snake and then the relaxed big yielding redirection motions and and the, the movement of with the cranes also direct striking and stuff that's where allegedly Sans and Feng would then use that for the basis to create Taiji Chuan I think this is my hypothesis again the one that I've I have seen a couple people uh, sort of say similar things I think Wu Dong sells Sun Sen Feng short I think Sun Sen Feng created Nei Jia Chuan as a whole internal martial arts as we know it as a whole so like the main fists and, and styles that again don't have Taiji Xingyi Bagua slapped on them from Wu Dong that's what he did he took the Shaolin stuff at that point in time reintegrated a bunch of Taoism back into it made it a little bit more whole body made it a little bit more internal and relaxed and then you have like Wu Dong Chuan so or Wu Dong Fa like the Wu Dong fist or method so so that that now created a, a whole new branch of martial arts for Neja Chuan so that I think again my hypothesis uh, a couple other few other people I've read have it too I'm pointing to my books that you can't see uh, so I'm not alone in that it makes sense to me that that this this was a broader bigger thing that he founded and and he sort of created the fundamental baseline sort of rules for these things to be considered internal so if you follow these things you can now consider it internal and Taiji Xingyi Bagua they all have places where they overlap sometimes fairly heavily you know you can find the Xingyi and Taiji or the Bagua and Taiji or the Bagua and Xingyi or the Xingyi and Bagua you know and then you get dudes like Sun Lutong in you know late 19th early 20th century who was a freaking genius wizard of this started kind of combining that you know used Xingyi as his baseline and then brought in sort of Bagua and Taiji in different ways with that and started kind of molding them back in I think Lu Hei Bafa does that as well I don't know Lu Hei Bafa I've seen it demonstrated and stuff like that so I, I'm, I'm I just mention it because that is something that I, I have seen through my research that it's sort of a combination of the three I can't speak with with much more 
experience than that with that but there i can speak from 20 plus years of experience at taiji singi bagua have a lot of overlap and i think that's because they have a a parent in common so it's almost like like neja chuan from from sun sun feng and wudong would be like latin and then taiji singi and bagua would be like you know italian and spanish and french you know they have their own thing they have their own history they have their own you know positives and negatives and and people who can do wonderful things with them in different ways uh, but there's there's also some understanding between them as well because they have that thing uh, as their origin in common so I think Sun Sun Feng would have then created Neijia Chuan as a whole then you start getting into now what about Taiji then Taiji Chuan I think yeah, Chen Wang Ting then did uh, create Taiji Chuan specifically as Taiji Chuan out of that larger internal bracket, that specific thing. So from what I from what I understand, uh, Chen Wang Ting was a military guy, so he had that experience and all that other stuff too. And then he, when he came back in after he was kind of done and came back into Chen Jago, the Chen village, he uh, then, you know, started kind of studying other stuff and, and, and some of the Taoist things and everything. And then was able to create sort of Taiji of that sort of yin yang theory and, and manifest like the, the, the eight jin of uh, Taiji and the five stepping, so the 13 original aspect of Taiji. Um, so, but if we go by the hypothesis of Sun Sun Feng creating like sort of Wu Dong Nei Jiao Gong Fu, then uh, excuse me, this is all tea. No, this is all tea, by the way. Um, then you have it where it would make sense that he either, like Sun Sun Feng, had this background and then trained maybe specifically with some other more sort of Taoist Taoist or learned like Nei Jia Chuan like the Sun Sen Feng Wudong Nei Jia Chuan and then sort of started playing with it and making it his own and then you start getting Chen Tai Ji Chuan and, and then the, the creation of Tai Ji Chuan itself as an offshoot of that larger Nei Jia Chuan uh, and then that passed down uh, you know several generations as a Chen Song Jing, I think I'm probably not pronouncing that right. Who I think was the one that also created the the new road. So we have the Lao Jia from Chen Wanting, and then the Xinjia from Ch, uh, Chen Zhang Jing. And he was also the person who taught Yang Lu Sen. Now that the stories are all over the place with that, including how he, you know, no, you can't teach Chen style outside of the Chen family, and that's it. You know, it's our secret family, Kung Fu. That's how we keep ourselves safe from these people who are raiding us in the village and everything. If they don't know our Kung Fu, they can't uh, plan how to defeat it and stuff like that. A lot of families did that all over the place. And it, it, was, it was a way legitimately people had to do things to keep themselves safe, unfortunately. So, uh, you know, whether or not he, you know, came into the family and, you know, sort of proved himself to be, you know, kind of a worthy sort of chap to do that or if he really did you know um hide out as like a butler or servant and then train in secret or or you know the other chen or taiji master like the tv show thing where you know he had um some uncle in the family who wasn't as good as the main guy but he could you know he was still good enough to start teaching yang lu sen and yang lu sen again had had some basis from what i understand he had other Kung Fu that he had learned before too so maybe he was able to pick up some things kind of quickly and then uh, you know again there's there's several sort of weird stories with it and then he was able to pick up uh, the basics you know the Peng Lu Jian, Kai Le Zhu Kao, the five steppings, put everything together the breathing, the relaxation, the whole body unity, the yin and yang combining uh, you know the the yielding and redirecting from it, the fodging, the silk reeling, 
able to able to do really well with all that uh, and then he started kind of formulating his own sort of thing with it. And he went back into Beijing and, you know, was, um, you know, made a name for himself around like the Imperial Palace and was training people there. Uh, so that might be the first inklings of maybe how some of the Yang style stuff started kind of really getting away from Chen style and away from, from some of the more martial or more, uh, openly martial aspects of it and then he had a couple of sons who uh you know were were training and teaching and and kind of made name for themselves as well i forget i forget all the son's name i do remember one of them being yang bon hao and his style was a little bit more small frame you know chen style's big frame yang style's kind of big to medium his was more small frame uh and he was also allegedly uh, maybe not the easiest, most compassionate, grooviest person to train under. You know, by several accounts that I've read, he was kind of mean. Uh, and then the next generation after that, we've get Yang Chenfu. Now, apparently, Yang Chenfu didn't really want to kind of get into the family business of Taiji at first. Maybe learned a little bit here or there. Really wasn't into it. Eventually, as he got older, he got into it more and became phenomenal. This is also, you know, late. We're we're we're, st we're getting into like you know late nineteenth, early twentieth century and stuff like that. So it's almost there's actually a picture, and it's got. It's to me if if you're like a kung fu guy, it's very similar to. I just heard the name of it too, and I blank. It starts with an S. But like the 1927 quantum physics, you know, symposium that's got like Einstein and Niels Bohr and I think Madame Marie Curie and and uh, like all those like Schrodinger, like all those like heavy hardcore physicists that whose names are bandied about on PBS specials and in half known classrooms around the world for the last especially 10, 15 years. Uh, since you know quantum theory is really getting ball rolling in people's imaginations and and us consciousness freaks are grabbing onto it with dear life to trying to force materialist scientists to get their head out of their asses um, it, there's a picture like that and it's got like Sun Lutong and like Yang Chenfu all these other people it's like if you read the histories and stuff it's it's really sort of like mind-blowing sort of picture but so Yang Chenfu uh, comes in and he's a bigger guy, but able to do weird and wonderful things with his Taiji. He can even do like push hands very uh, amazingly from a chair, uh, which is difficult to do. I actually had moments where I, I felt it uh, from work because I, I, you know, with uh, the kids I work with uh, quite often get fairly violent. And there's been a couple of times where, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, keep people safe from each other and I'm sitting in a chair and they're coming at me and I'm trying to keep them from going out and running around and you know and I'm I'm still in my chair and I don't have any other backup it's just me so I can't do a lot I'm just trying to keep stuff off the chair but I could feel myself rooting like I can through my feet through the chair and once I did that I could sort of like turn on like the pungjing and everything like that it was cool uh but to do that consistently and and with the skill Yang Chenfu had with it is ridiculous and amazing but he's the one that will set the yang style taiji the way we really see it now and yang style allegedly is the most sort of practiced taiji in the world so the way they play it now and yang zeng dao and yang jun um i think yang zeng dao i think is yang Fu's grandson and yang jun is yang zeng dao's grandson the way they've kind of had it in the last maybe 15 20 years has kind of veered away a little bit uh, a few parts of the long form have kind of changed uh, you can look and see Fu Zhong Wen now Fu Zhong Wen actually wrote a book on Yang style Taiji and he was one of Yang Chen Fu's like last disciples if not the last but there's actual video footage he was he was enough into the 20th century that that he was filmed um, so if you watch his Fu Zhong Wen if you watch his playing that's going to be like the closest to Yang Chen Fu that you can see now. 
you know, Yang Chen Fu a lot of pictures, and there's a couple books with uh, pictures that he things and, and stuff that he wrote and translated out, but you're not going to see a video of him. Uh, but you can kind of compare that to where, like, especially Yang Jun is kind of teaching now, and you can see where they're veering away from it, and then they're getting into more of this sort of health <coughs> relaxation stuff. And that's part of it, and if people want to train internals with that, mainly, great, the qigong, the meditation, the health, the relaxation part is definitely stuff that you have to train in internals. You have to do it. But you also need the martial quality of it too. If it has a chuan or a zong in that, that means it's a martial art and you're not going to be doing it correctly if you have absolutely no idea about the martial intent to it whatsoever. E intent is huge with internals because you're not using like the gross muscle stuff. So you have to use your mind to generate a lot of the stuff that's going on as opposed to that's the gross muscle tension. But, uh, you know, again, if the focus is kind of one, that's fine, but you have to know the other. Just like if you're learning Xing Yi because you want to do well in, like, Sancho competitions or MMA or something like that, great. Learn the martial aspects, absolutely. But you have to know the health, the meditative, and the, the Qigong qualities to it as well. Or actually, especially with Xing Yi, you're going you're gonna to mess yourself up. If you, you know, Sun, uh, Sun Lu Tong talks about it, point it because I do know where this book is. Uh, it talks about it. Yeah, if you, if you play the Xing Yi too harshly with the wrong sort of intent and everything, you're going to almost double back and mess up the organs and the things that you're trying to help. So you got to be, you got to be careful how you do that. But it all needs to be in there. So after, you know, Yang Chen Fu, we start getting guys coming in after that. And there's a couple of people there. There's two different like Wu styles, like Wu and Wu Hao. Uh, again, this is this is already getting longer than I meant to, so I'm trying to not. It's, it's not going to be super detailed. If I do write the book, it, there will be more detail about this. But you have it where two different Wu's, and they kind of went back and went back to like Yang Chen Fu's, and maybe a little bit before. At least one of them learned some Chen style in with that too, and they both made it a smaller frame. Uh, so it's, you know, it's kind of, it doesn't, you know, it's kind of within like shoulder hip sort of thing. It doesn't get really big, you know, Chen styles out here, Yang styles here, you know, eventually when you start getting to like the Wu's and the, the Sun style, it's kind of here and in more. And then, yeah, the, the aforementioned Sun Lutong, uh, learned one of the Wu styles and then kind of added some Xing Yi stuff to that too and made Sun style, uh, Taiji. Around the fifties the sort of government brought in uh, a bunch of the masters uh, of a, a lot of different stuff and, and kind of made them make a sort of compulsory form so this is where you get the the beijing the 24 form and i think the 48 as well uh, if it doesn't have a family name to it, it's just the 24 form or the 48 form uh it might also ha it's going to be this it might also have you know Pe uh, Peking, Beijing, or government form. Uh, a lot of the times you might see it in America at least, and where I was first exposed to it was called simplified. This was sort of it was a way to get people to kind of get back into you know a certain amount of, sort of nationalistic pride. Look, we have this stuff, we weren't able to kill it, so let's use it, sort of thing by the government, which oh governments well we can't kill this thing then we're going to find a way to uh, perpetuate our own agenda with it uh, so they kind of uh, codified it even more and made it uh, you know now they have certain compulsory things so if you, know, you go to like a Chinese tournament and you're doing the 24 form the amount that you play the entire form which with all those things I can't imagine having to be a judge for that uh, but part of that is even you know the you're even judged on the uniform so if you're a male, you have to have a certain uniform with a certain number of uh, frog buttons. If you're a female, it has to come across and have a certain things. So it's almost like the, you know, you write a, uh, an essay for school and you get points deducted or anything if the format is in a certain way and your bibliography doesn't look a certain way. You can write the most brilliant essay in the world, but if this really technical stuff isn't there, you're going to get docked, sort of like that. Uh, so then, then we have now, and then it really started kind of influencing the West, and um, you know Chen Manqing coming in and and kind of taking Yang style, and 
I think I, I think I finally got a few years ago because I, I saw the Chen Man Ching stuff. And I'm like, oh, I was really not liking it for a long time. And then as I started tinkering and playing more, I think I see kind of where maybe his intent was was to really take traditional Yang style and really internalize it. So it comes off kind of like um, smaller and really more internal but that didn't get translated so now you got a lot of people in the past 40 50 years doing what you know i've heard called sort of hippie air dancing and and the sort of the stuff where they they let old people sort of wave their hands around and everything and it's like no they, there's specific benefits that these things have for people of all ages and all things and all this other stuff even from a chair and by not understanding it and not even bothering to freaking care about trying to understand it, just think you have this little thing and knowing it, which bugs me. Same thing with yoga I've seen and stuff like that too. Or, or anything. Any, anything, anything. We get people who do that even with science. We get people who do that with magic, like the people who go off on the do what thou will, I just do what I want. And it's like, I'm not a Crowley fan. Guy was an abusive mess, but you know what? That's not what he meant. But no one wants to do the research to figure out or understand what he actually meant. And he even spells it out in, in a couple different places. Stuff with Tai Chi, you can, especially nowadays, in you know the 21st century with YouTube and, and all this other stuff, there's tons of books. There's tons of books that you don't even have to pay for. You can just find PDFs for like these old school resources that, you know, 15, yeah, 15 or more years ago when I was working at Borders, stuff was out of print and I couldn't find. And I tried for years to get stuff. Now you can just download a PDF of it or watch, you know, a couple of YouTube things. And, and yeah, there's a lot of schmucks out there, but there's a lot of really good information out there too. But that's effort. And it's not just having this hard thing handed to you and pat on the back and away you go, you have it. Uh, so that, again, short, that's kind of the Taiji thing. Now, with Xingyi, uh, Xingyi's a little different. Well, uh, similar but a little different. Uh, Ji Long Feng it was the person whom I was taught was the person who created Xingyi Chuan. Allegedly, he credits the creation of Xingyi Chuan to Yu Fei. Now Yu Fei from like the Romance of the Three Kingdoms Warring States period was one of the three sort of heroes, three brothers. It was Liu Bei, Yu Fei, and then uh, Guang Gong who later sort of became the sort of Guan Yu, the sort of like Buddha of martial artists and, and everything. So you go into a store or, or you know a school or something like that and they have you know this big figure with this big you know long kwando weapon you know the, the big long stick with the spear on one end and a big huge blade on the other maybe red face probably a long magnificent beard and he's real that's Guan Yu or Guan Gong and he was one of the three with that now Guan you know, Yu Fei was mostly a spear guy and and the legend has it allegedly that his you know rank and file would know like Eagle Claw Gong Fu. But Yu Fei developed Xing Yi Chuan based on the five element theory and, and internals. So so like the then again the Neja Chuan, Neja Fa, and then he brought in sort of more five element theory and that would also correspond to certain organs. Um, and then linking routines with that and then um, ten or twelve depending upon your style animal shapes. Now, Xing Yi, now, Tai Chi Chuan is, is the grand ultimate. It's not Tai Chi as in Chi as in energy. It's Tai Chi. It's the grand ultimate. It's the first, there's Wu Ji, which is the sort of, it's, it's, Wu Ji is almost the state before the Big Bang. And then like Tai Chi is that Big Bang before it separates. So it's like the one, so you have the, the nothing and then the one. And it breaks down into two, the yin and yang, and then the yin and yang break down into greater and lesser of each, the four, and become like the bagua of the eight things, and then, you know, the five elements and stuff, and those turn into the 64 things with the I Jing, and then the 10,000, which means everything. Tai Chi is the grand ultimate. It's that one thing that before that is this, where you want to get to, that state of Wu Ji, that sort of non action. Xing Yi is shape, Xing meaning shape, 
E intent. So you have shape intent or form and mind boxing. So your body makes the shape and it's driven by the intent and the mind. And uh, it has, since you, again, you, if we bring in Yu Fei, it has uh, a basis in spear fighting with it. Now, Xing Yi is the more sort of yang, more sort of martial. Uh, of the three, I sort of call it like the gateway internal because if, if you're used to more hard style martial arts, this is going to be the one that's almost more attractive. Uh, and it might be the one that can start cluing you into now how different internals can really be. But Ji Long Feng <coughs> was the the you know allegedly found these scrolls from Yu Fei and then rediscovered Xing Yichuan. Uh, and the way I had it in in my research was he did that to legitimize it uh, and it's a cult it's more of a cultural thing where if you can attach it to this historical near mythological figure as opposed to sort of taking credit for yourself then it would have more sort of credence uh, and allegedly at some point in time either him or someone else was supposed to have been shackled with it as well and that's where somewhere like that that short fodging, that almost like one inch punch sort of power and stuff got led into it as well. So again, the internals got brought back in to uh, someone who had who had other sort of training and, and, and those sort of bled in together to this other thing. So there's a couple different styles, like two, I think there's like two kind of main branches with that and they all came in and did all this other stuff and I, I uh, you know, uh, then you get like uh, Sun Lutong again, late, you know, early 20th century sort of thing, uh, who then sort of made his own thing for it as well and made his own style with it and then started using it with Bagua and with Tai Chi as well. I've seen some styles where, you know, if they throw a punch, they'll do this. It's like ma they're, they're overly manufacturing this with the body. But what happens is that if you, there, if you actually do sort of proper fudging and with the body mechanics, there's almost like a, there is almost like a splash to it. You know, it comes out and then you, you um, have that exploding power out and then you release. And as you're picking up and continuing the motion, because you don't stop. One of the main baselines for internals is that from the opening to the closing, it's one contiguous motion. It's one contiguous. We don't stop and pose. So if you see tournaments and you see me judging and someone's sitting there and then they stop for a second because they're posing because they think they look cool, you know I'm docking points because you don't stop. Um, but it's, it's someone trying to outwardly force that relaxed properly released fudging energy in it as opposed to actually just playing it and letting it happen when the whole body is coordinated with the breath and the motion to come out properly. So um, with Xing Yi, you also kind of have to be a little careful because uh, again, as this, it, it is not an, it's not nice. I think Bruce Kumar Francis said something like Taiji is do what thou wilt and Xing Yi is do what I will. You know, Tai Ji and, and Bagua have a certain that, that yielding and redirecting. Xing Yi has it too, but Xing Yi is more, you're standing there, now I'm standing there, and you can't get up again. You know, there, there's a, there's a, there's, it's more Yang. <laughs> so if you're playing a lot of that, you got to make sure that, you know, you're really able to manage and and notice first of all your emotional state with it because your emotional state starts getting too amped up and young this is going to make it so you're not playing mildly enough and you're coming off that center so for any of you star wars nerds out there you know how they talked about how mace windu's style of you know lightsaber play 
brought him sort of up to the dark side, but not quite. That's one of the reasons he had the, like the purple lightsaber because it's supposed to be blue, but it got a little sort of in there, not quite bled red like a Sith one or a dark sider would be, but it's kind of cutting close to that edge a little bit. Pulls himself back. That's kind of like Shingy. It's like you don't want to go to the dark side of now just being a freaking monster. But if you're going to turn on Shingy, it's not going to be nice for the other person. Again, Francis was talking about how the old, some of the older tournaments, like they had to kind of rearrange some stuff because the Shingy guys were just going in there and like killing people. Yeah, that's not good. Uh, now, Bagua, Bagua Zong, again, we, we have the same sort of thing as before, where we have someone who has uh, other sort of training from like Shaolin. It goes back in, re resets with some Taoism, and now comes out with something else. So we have Dong Ai Chuan, who I've heard in a couple places he was supposed to have been like a eunuch, but then everyone's like, no, because he had kids. How? What? Um, but still, I think he was supposed to be a tax collector as well. So he needed something to sort of protect himself. And it's also one of the reasons, allegedly, why well, Bagua is supposed to be good for using with multiple opponents. But he, uh, again, learned this other stuff, Shaolin, if I remember correctly, and then started training with more hardcore straight up Taoists and they taught him circle walking now circle walking is not walking in a circle now if any of my students are listening to this right now they probably said it with me on that because I've said it a million times circle proper circle walking is not just walking in a circle something that even now people who have been at tournaments where I've been the judge are still probably miffed at that anyway too because I probably dock points for that as well but I also don't hold people I, I hold people to the standard that I was held to when I had to do competing I don't like competing, I never like competing it's not fun for me, but I did it um, because in case I had students someday who wanted to do it uh, and then also it can get in and then I, I felt it was expected of me to, to do it and expected of me to eventually become a judge and stuff too so that's why I had to do it uh, but I did not enjoy doing tournaments but so he he you know the some of if you're playing well I'll go I, let me let me save that for a minute and I'll explain this other stuff so he he would learn uh, learn that bring in the Taoism stuff like that and then the, they taught him like the circle walking how to make things internal as opposed to external using the body's energy and, and breathing and coming from the da lower Dantian and all this other stuff so he had his style but mostly what he would teach other people I believe he was in Beijing as well was how to make their styles of Gong Fu on the circle and have some internal properties and he had two kind of main students one was Yin Fu uh, and Yin Fu I believe had his own other practice and was sort of taught how to put that on there and and allegedly from what I understand they kind of had a little bit of falling out and then uh, Dong Hai Chuan started teaching a man named Chen Ting Hua. Chen Ting Hua was also called Glasses Cheng because he worked at a spectacle uh, establishment I think he wore them as well Chen Ting Hua wasn't the same sort of martial artist that Dong Hai Chuan was used to teaching. He was mostly a wrestler, so probably Swai Jiao. It's one of the reasons why I went and I did some cross training in Swai Jiao was to get better at the Bagua, and, and my sort of throw wrestling game really wasn't super great. Um, it's also, also, if you get a chance, especially with any of Sifu Irvin's schools in the Cleveland area, it, it's really an amazing thing. Uh, Swai Jiao. Um, so, but Dong Hai, uh, Chen Ting Hua, rather, was a Swai Jiao guy. So, allegedly, the, the, the Chen, Cheng style, not Chen, C-H-E-N, as we would say, C-H-E-N-G, Cheng style, Cheng Ting Hua, uh, allegedly, his style is a little bit, is supposed to be closer to Dong Hai Chuan's style, only with maybe some more 
wrestling Swigel stuff went in. In fact, there there's there's a few motions. I'm like, what the f good is this? Like this isn't even. It didn't seem like this should be internal because it's one thing the way, you know, you kind of bend in like an in like a an L and have a hand here. I'm like, I didn't get that at all. I started taking Swigel. I know where that comes from now. Cheng style is it has like eight mother palms and then eight palm changes based on the mother palm. So it almost sort of feels a little bit like Xingyi with that. We have these this sort of groundwork of thing and these other things that are built up around that. But the way the mother palms are, it's you're, you're just walking the circles holding these postures. So in there it has a very similar aspect to now holding standing postures like anyway. Again, going back into that's where the Taoist influence, they had all these standing postures, and now, you know, with, with the three planes that you can make circles in, putting all that together in different ways, you have these different things that work. Uh, so then you have that, uh, so you can work the mother palms and, and play them uh, like you're doing standing meditation. And then the, the palm changes are, are based on that and, and change and go back and forth and up and down and under and kick. And uh, apparently each sort of motion with the foot can be a kick in some, ash, in some fashion. Now Bagua Zong, the Zong is palm, but still denotes a martial art. So uh, just like Chuan meaning fist means boxing. You hear oh, Chinese boxing, well, Chuan. Uh, it says fist or denotes boxing, denotes a martial art. The Zong does the same thing with Bagua. Uh, but it's pretty much all palm. And you can, uh, there's a couple places in the the linking routine from Cheng style that I know where it does, it, there's one thing where it kind of opens up and, and fists, and another thing where you come out almost looks like uh, praying mantis. But it's, it's more like you're hitting ox jaw with it so uh, so those are kind of like the the two main sort of baguas that kind of went off from that now cheng style has kind of a couple offshoots as well uh based on sort of the students and sons and everything like that sun s-o-n and then there there was a sort of sun track with that besides sun lutong and and there's one that like the li jin ru it was the sort of main guy. Now he's, he's older now, but he was like the sort of main Chen guy uh, for a long, long time. And I think he still is. And that's kind of like one road. And that's kind of more we'll go. And then there's like this this other son sort of road uh, that again has similarities, but a little bit different in some ways. And then the Cheng style is what Sun Lutong learned. And then Sun Lutong took all that and kind of smushed it together all of Cheng style and kind of smushed it together with his Xing Yi. So instead of eight mother palms and eight palm changes, it's almost like ten palms. So uh, you know, you have the uh, sort of equivalent of the first two sort of palm changes but they're Liang Li and Sejan and then you have eight sort of animal palms that are kind of palm changey, and you can see where they came from in Cheng. But Sun Lutong would do where Cheng style's first palm change would come in here and come out. Sun's is. So it almost has the same internal feeling, but it's smaller and more internal with it. And then, but a lot of times you see now a lot of people will do like this up and down thing, and their feet are doing this, and they're just sort of stepping around. I'm like, no. It's not Bagua. Uh, so then you have uh, what's come in from that. So that's that's the sort of, you know, it's, it's over an hour, I know, but the sort of quick and dirty uh, thing with that, with um, internals. And, and wrapping in with that, my sort of hypothesis. I know I'm missing a ton of people, a ton of important people. And, and a ton of people's um, influence and, and way they steered things and then offshoots, 
you know, everyone's got offshoots of this, and there's a Chen style that looks a little bit different than this. If you watch the main Chen guys now, Chen Zhao Wang, Chen Zhao Jing, uh, Chen Zhang Lei, Feng Ziqiang, Wen Guanyi, then you have like Chen Bing, Chen Ziqiang. Like they all, like every, like the, just watch like the Laoja thing and it all looks, they all look different. You know, there's some things that are kind of similar through that, but even if you watch Chen Zhao Wang from like his videos from like 20, 30 years ago versus him now, even that looks like different too, which is really interesting. It's interesting to sort of like chart that. So I know I'm missing a ton of people. I know, know I'm missing a ton of events and, and a lot of things. And I sort of brushed over the kind of the, the, the two main sort of styles of, of Xing Yi. And then I sort of went through the two Wu style ones. I didn't even bring up Yi Chuan, which is sort of based on Xing Yi. Um, but, those are, but honestly, those are things I don't know as well, to be completely honest. Like I've never learned Wu style. I've, no, I've known a couple people who were Wu stylists. I've never learned Wu style. You know, I've been woodshedding some Sun style. I know some Sun style people and everything like that. I've been I've been taught the Xingyi and Bagua, with, so that's kind of like a natural progression with there. You know, a lot of the focus, a lot of the research and and literature you're going to see is is going to be on Taiji. You're going to see a lot of that. You know. Um, in, in my lineage, you know, I have my teachers, Master Rick Mayer. He first learned from Master Will Duncan, and Will Duncan learned from Grandmaster Hu Wei Yu. Will Duncan actually had my teacher go and train with Master Hu Wei Yu as well. Um, I've done a few workshops with them and stuff like that. His teachers were um, Idami, Bai Bing Ru, and Wa Chan Rong. Wa Chan Rong was actually a. Uh, apparently an imperial guard and it's one sword form that we know which I think is, is supposed to, Sun Yang sword is supposed to be like an eight immortal sword but I think it's from Sun style it was actually supposedly was teaching in the imperial palace uh, that's the, the history we got from that uh, but so, some of those guys trained like directly with or either directly with or like one step away from dudes like Yang Shen Fu and Sun Lutong and, and Chen Tinghua as well. So they learned from either them or like one generation, one step off of them, like those sort of main ones. So those that's why those are kind of like the three ones that I know or, or have at least some cognizant ability to speak of uh, a little bit more than others. You know, but then you get, but then again, you get a lot of people, like I said, even with their, their yoga or the Taiji, you're like, well, what about your teachers and their teachers and like their lineage? And they want, oh, I don't know. It's just my, my teacher just sort of, and uh, immediately there, I, I honestly, it might be a certain sort of prejudice, but I start checking out, uh, you know, they're, there, there is a certain cultural aspect. I mean, if you're going to learn these arts, there's certain parts of the culture you're going to, you should be picking up on. Um, at the very least, to just know the culture that bred the thing. And out of the culture, you, you do have sort of, you should be able to speak with some intelligence about your lineage. You know, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, you get some, I made up my own Tai Chi. No, the F, you didn't. Oh, well, I just do this, so I just put it on a circle, and it's Bob. No, it's not. Unless it has these certain principles behind it. Just playing your karate kata slow does not make it taiji. If you have stepping that goes forward, back, left, right, and center, and then you're able to incorporate ward off, roll back, press, push, pull down or pluck, splitting, elbow, and bump or shoulder, you can incorporate those. Then now we're talking about Tai Chi. You know, if your your circle walking is circle walking and not just bouncing around in some curves, then maybe we can start talking about Bagua. If you're playing Xing Yi and it doesn't have any five element fists in with it, you know, uh, you're not playing Xing Yi. So, you know, if, if I take, you know, if I play Chen style, and I flex a few times, and I play it really fast, and I get stiff with it, it doesn't make it Shaolin. You know, there's certain things that, that have to be met for that. You know, and, and I have, again, I have another video of bitching about, 
you know, people making up their own martial arts or people making up their own forms of martial arts without knowing what the hell it is that they're talking about. And that bugs the crap out of me because again, and, and, and then part of this history too, I mean, we might as well, you know, part of part in, in several places in the history, and we're talking at least 1500 to somewhere between 2,500 and 1,500 years worth of history or more, people were dying for this. You know, they have stories of, you know, the, the slaughter out of Shaolin and only the five students, you know, were able to be saved and this other stuff like that. But I think Shaolin got sacked multiple times. So it means people were slaughtered because of this. You know, we got we get people, you know, even Taoists were persecuting uh, Buddhist, Buddhist persecuting Taoist, Confucius were like Pfft, all of you, you know, and the government got pissy about things here or there, and periodically would start killing people for whatever. The Cultural Revolution in the 1900s, you know, and and everything going on now. And there were people who died for this. There were people whose livelihoods were this. There were people who, you know, in the lineage, this was their life. They studied this, they lived it, they breathed it, they did everything for this. This is what they did, who they were, uh, to not only become the peak of that art that they could, but also to pass it on to another generation so that other people could be able to grow and live and progress and, and awaken to their enlightened state, become more healthy, um, become more connected with spirit and consciousness. There are a lot of people who who just did everything they could to try and make this something for people in later generations. And I think that that needs to be respected more than just some gym bunny on a on a on a on a kick from having a, you know, a a, a six week you know, two hour a week little, you know, uh, workshop or a little weekend retreat down in, in, uh, in some resort or something like that. And now they think they can teach Tai Chi or they think they can teach yoga or, you know, all this other stuff. And they, they put no effort in once they reach a certain point, you know, some of those black belts that, you know, now, you know, their, their knowledge doesn't expand, but their, their waistline does, you know, ask them to play anything and they can't, play a damn thing to save their life but oh they're you know sensei or sifu or something really important now no 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 no. go back to the well and figure out what your teachers were trying to do this is something this is one of the things i connected with my teacher we always had this idea of basics 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 foundations 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 but now 21 years later sometimes i'll have days when i train i won't even train a whole full routine i'm just taking out maybe the silk railing and a few of the postures and just workshopping those, wood shedding those, playing them big, playing them small, playing them tense, playing them super relaxed, playing all this other stuff. Go back to the well, go back to the well, go back to the well. So Shaolin did this, Taoist said that, Yogi said this, it's still worth it to know and go back to see and train and, and think about the DNA of this thing that you have, as opposed to just sort of resting on some laurels that you might have and then not going further because especially internals i have one of my students that I pr practically every week he was like hey, it's always a study it's always a study it's always a study because it is you know this it's i mean you're basically you know this this is internal alchemy now, alchemy doesn't mean literally taking you know tin or lead and turning it into gold those are allegories that's symbolism you know, even the Taoist alchemists, there was sort of a code when they're talking about mercury or cinnabar or lead. That's like a code for certain things with the dantians and the body and the energy and stuff. The people who are mixing that and drinking it, yeah, died horribly, as you would expect. So even alchemy in the West is symbolic for making you a better spiritually realized, enhancing your consciousness being. You know, and, and internals can directly help you with that. Trust me, I went from being an absolute, like, suicidally depressed, homicidally, like, ragey, nihilist, crazed, depressed, panic attack monkey, you know, into not that anymore. It's, I mean, I've had 
like weird and wonderful experiences uh, and crazy stuff that I would never have believed at 15, 16, 17 years old. And now I'm just like, ow, if I told people some of the stuff I've experienced to just doing my sitting meditation, they'd be like, here's pills in a padded room or something like that. So it's, but these are real experiences. And, and, you know, they, they, with earnest, consistent practice, realistic and, and real practice, as opposed to just sort of half-assed, you know, gym bunnies running around with everything, man, there really isn't a limit to where you can go with it and what you can do with it. Now, you're not going to be flying, you're not going to be shooting fireballs, you know, unless you get really good at like lucid dreaming and astral projection or something like that, then that's a whole other conversation. Allergies are kicking in for some reason. Um, oh, dude mowed the lawn. Anyway. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a way to take the base thing of the material of you and your body and put it through, you know, um, like a mortar and pestle and, and purification and, you know, heat and effort and heat and effort and pounding down and heat and effort and all this other stuff. And you're, you're purifying that consciousness. You're purifying that energy. Purifying. Purifying is, I don't know, something your cat does maybe. Into now something more refined. It's constant, constant refinement. And you can kind of go back. And then when, when you get into like those really sort of like higher sort of consciousness states you're in there a little bit more and then you kind of bring a little bit more back david lynch was even talking about that it's like you're dipped in gold but then you have to come back and then you, you have to constantly sort of re-dip in gold to get that gold to to be able to stick and the more you go back into that that sort of transcendence with it the more sort of gold you bring back and it's a constant thing that's a constant cycle with it and that's, I mean, that's those, those are places you can go with internals. You can heal all sorts of stuff. You know, my teacher uh, had epileptic problems that he didn't take meds for. He was able to manage and control a lot of his stuff with just the training. I do a lot of things with my migraines, with my mood. This is my meds. I told the ex, you know, back in the day too, is like, I gotta, I gotta train every day, you know, and I really started adding in. I wish I would have done the sitting meditation earlier, but I had to get out of being a young, stupid idiot. Um, but then, you know, 10, 12 years ago, I'm adding more and more of the sitting meditation into it as well. And it's like, I got to do that consistently. I got to do that every day. And I have trained every single day, come hell or high water, and some of it's been hell, believe me, at least 15, 20 minutes. But if I have three or four days where it's only 15, 20 minutes, stuff starts getting messed up. My insomnia starts coming in. I have problems with my moods, you know, the anxiety and, and panic attacks, the depression, um, you know, maybe even some sort of manic episode starts kicking in a little bit, something like that. Um, so I have to have a certain amount of, of, of training and practice and consistency with my meditation and my training. Or again, that starts kind of, things start kind of getting thrown out of equilibrium. So there's a lot of things that can be managed there's a lot of things that can be healed. There's a lot of things that can be got through and a lot of things that can be awoken to through proper, consistent training. And with that, and I think, and again, and like I said, it's the basics and the fundamentals which are really going to be the money for it. You know, the jumping and the kicking and the, all this other stuff and all these other weird and wonderful flippity flu other things like that might be great. It might help with certain mental training. It might be great for self-confidence. It might be great to kind of keep a certain athleticism and flexibility in there. Fabulous. But the basics and the fundamentals are going to be where the growth is going to be. You always kind of, you know, go back in and, and, and drink from the well sort of thing. And I think that understanding some of where the art comes from helps with that understanding that all these different various parts sort of fit together in in the underlying sort of chromosomes of whatever it is that you're practicing 
you know, say it's like, I just want to do, I just want to play my Yang style. Oh, I don't care about Xingyi or Bagua. I don't care about Chen style. Just let me play my Yang style. But it helps to know, okay, you know, where it came from, from Yang Chen Fu, and then back to his grandfather, Yang Lu Sen, what the Chens were trying to get into, whenever that all comes in, and how all these things, because all that is still present. All that is there. You know, if, if you do any sort of ancestor work or anything else like that, you know, you might not, uh, what is it, I found out, you know, my mom's side is Scottish, Irish, English, and found out probably Viking, you know, and, and there might be stuff in, you know, my dad's side's all Eastern European, and there's a bunch of stuff, and, and where his family's from, there's a lot of crossroads of a lot of things, there's who knows what the hell's in that. Uh, what's going on with with different people coming up and and around and around? It's, it's a it's a sort of liminal trans, transition sort of area of sort of Europe and getting in towards the Middle East and everything, and then coming up from the Mediterranean as well. So there's a lot of cross in there, and who knows what is is sort of in there in that DNA. But those people still had, even if I, I don't connect with that side as much, but even if I don't. That DNA, not only the, the nature and the nurture, the, the, the genetic and epigenetic um, conditions and, and things that have been passed down are still part of my makeup, whether or not I connect with them or not. Whether, or, whether I connect with them or not. There we go. Less redundant. Um, so as I'm, you know, maybe I, I do some ancestor work or something like that, I, I still got to give a certain amount of thanks to that or else, you know things wouldn't have worked out for me here and 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 who knows maybe if things had been different things might have been better and easier but then again maybe I wouldn't have been able to do some of the things I've been able to do or have some of the experiences I've been able to have or maybe I wouldn't be able to get as far as I am going to be able to get in this life without that and I have to do a bunch of stuff again I don't I'm not looking forward to that so the same thing in if if you're connecting in with some of these traditions, it's good to know at least some of the some of where it came from, some of the history of it, some of the the uh, what what people were trying to understand and train and what they thought was important. Every every martial art form as we view martial arts, every form, every kata, um, the dalu practice, you know everything like that is someone somewhere in your lineage's shadow boxing routine it doesn't have to go that certain way it's just that hey these are the principles to it these are the principles like hungar for example these are the principles of hungar this is what we want to train this is how we like training it and then these combinations i found as i created this work best for me as I fight and as I train and what feels right as I go through things and what makes sense from the things that I was taught from my teachers and the things I learned when I was teaching because you should be learning as you teach I've had tons of times when I teach where I'll say something or I'll do something I'm like oh crap where the hell did that come from or I'll be like oh 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 I just figured something out wait and I'll be like thank you I'll look, I'll look to a student I've done this a couple of times like thank you thank you thank you I just figured something out it's this and people are looking at me like the hell but you should still be learning as you're teaching that's that's part of learning is teaching and you, you learn a lot from teaching uh, so somewhere somewhere someone someone somewhere said this is what works best for me and then they taught their students this and that got translated down or changed a little bit because it worked better for somebody else um, so it's almost like reading a book maybe it's been translated a couple of times but it's almost like reading a book because you're you're getting into someone's thoughts at a certain point of time in history and they're speaking to you through the the medium of martial arts and the medium of that style but they're almost speaking to you now with 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 like their body and their physicality as well as as like energy so it's it's kind of interesting and in, in bringing you you're, you you know especially if if you train long enough and you're consistent long enough and make it a lifestyle and now maybe you have students too you're part of that flow now so you have to kind of treat it with respect you know if you become 
you know, if you go from an open to closed door student, you know, back in the day, and that was sort of like the mob to a certain extent, like you've got certain responsibilities now to the art that you have to uphold. And I kind of take that seriously. And that includes not being ignorant of where things came from. All right? So subscribe, like, uh, share all the usual YouTube good stuff. And uh, see for John. I will see you later. Thank you for listening and dealing with an hour and a half of me ranting.